Round two, we've done technology, or at least a few bits of it, to give you a bit of thinking about where tech might take us. I thought it might be interesting to talk about human beings and who we are and how we are. I'm not getting into sort of HR things, but generally talking about people. One of the things I started off by looking at this quote is um, we will increasingly have to engage, forgive me for using technology, but this is the, the link if you like, with new technology to do the work we're doing, doing the work we're doing. Which makes sense, doesn't it? And we've had the conversation, many of you are doing this already. So it's about increasingly getting used to using AI or any of these other forms of technology at work or in work in whatever we do. What I thought might be interesting is to look at this in fine detail for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> You're right, I'm not going to. Basically, there are a whole range of things that are changing us, in, and some of those are societal level issues, where the society is going to. Of course, we know that. Ch changing of work environments, and we're gradually creeping up on um, um, hybrid forms of working. When the pandemic hit, then people finally got it, and now post-pandemic, we're trying to work out what the best ways are for individual firms and organisations. Of course, more diversity in the workplace is always of value, but now we're seeing that as specific goals. And that leads to not just diversity, but then it's actually coping with the diversity that we've got. And how do you make that work? Work-life balance is an old thing from the 80s, if you like, but still we need to try and work out what it is we're trying to achieve. And if our company develops, generates as much money using some new technology, do I need the human beings to work as hard and therefore, am I offering more to people by coming to my firm in their lives than, I, than others might? So you get smarter people. So that's the theory behind that. And obviously, things like demographic change, and I'll come into that a bit more later. Thinking about that, innovation and technology, we've just covered to a great degree. But all of those current things we're talking about, like big data was a hideous phrase that came up some years ago, is how much data do you use? How much external data do you use in your world? Where does it come from? What human being can manage that for you and bring it into your world? And of course, automation and various forms of intelligent matter in that regard. Changing business priorities and perspectives. What, are, what is it to be in business? What is your purpose? Or more importantly, what's your higher purpose that inspires people to want to come along and work in your world? And that's always something we have in our firms, but obviously more and more as we are trying to attract scarcer resource that actually understands how to work in this new way, we have to be cleverer. Uh, and increasingly, um, the world's economy is shifting to Asia away from North America, Europe. And that shift means that eventually things like our cars become more designed for the Asian market. I don't know if you've noticed that cars today have massive grills on the front, and that is an Asian characteristic. It was not built for a Western market. So already, Western markets are a secondary market. And increasingly, you'll find English is a label stuck on an Indonesian bottle. So increasingly, the money is not in Europe and North America. The money is in Asia and fast-growing economies. So we will have to get used to being secondary economies. What does that feel like? Discuss again. So we're doing that in one second. That's it. We've done that. We've done the whole move to Asia in one, one comment. Resources are changing, the scarcity, the ac access to resources. We know what China's been doing and others, but mostly China. And of course, things like how do we conserve the planet, its resources, its lifestyle, our lifestyle, as we're changing the nature of the way the world works in so many ways. Law increasingly is changing. Politics is, is becoming more uh, convergent as opposed to divergent in our democracies. And in fact, there are now in the world, just past, in fact, there are more autocracies in the world and autocrats and dictators than there are democracies. So there are more people living in more places that are not democratic. So there is no assumption the world runs on democratic lines. That happens to be where we've come from. Anyway, there's an interesting website you might look up that shows where the center of the world is economically. And it has a little dot that moves around the world over the centuries. And it runs around from, started in Asia, because in 1820, China was the largest economy in the world. You knew that, yeah? So basically, in two long cycles, it's gone back to China. And basically, you watch this little dot go over Europe, because Britain ran the world for a while. Then it went over to America, then America ran the world for a while. Then the little dot gets to Newfoundland, stops, and comes all the way back to Asia again. So basically, we're just repeating what we did before. It's not new. It's new to us, but it's not new in the world. Right. 
thinking about work and jobs, which is probably more important, one of the things I love is our forecast is the chances are by 2040, which is now only 17 years away, or they're about 16 years away, only 1 billion or 6 billion workers will be in a job we recognise. So if you look at the analysis, the, the chances are, and to put that in perspective, one table will probably have a job we recognise, and the rest of you have got jobs that we can't even imagine. What's that like? And it's happening really rapidly. So thinking about the work we do, and certainly the work our kids do, and the work their kids do, will be stunningly different from the sort of work we do today. It is very unlikely to be the same for a lot of good reasons. Let's just think about people. I quite like people, most of you are people. This is a good thing to start from, we're, we're going to talk about people. In the world, there were people who were born and stayed alive and did most economic activity. That's the green bit. That's the people in the world. This is 2000, 2050. That's the green bit. That's Europe, North America, most of the places where people were born and stayed alive. The purple bit, whoa. I didn't realize that ended. The purple, <laughs> the purple bit is where people are being born and are staying alive for the first time. You nearly got rid of me. Staying alive for the first time. And we're halfway up that ski slope, which will happen once in the planet's history. So you're living it exactly as we are. So anybody born around 2050, 2060, you were down here when you were born, and now you're up here. And all these people were born and living in places that they weren't staying alive in before. Does that make sense? And they are not doing things that we expected people to do. They're buying different things, they're living in different places, they're experiencing different things. And what's dead cool is over 2030, 8.6 billion, by 2050 is about 10 billion people, and we'll top out around about 11 billion people. So we're not quite finished having people, we're very good at having babies. As a population, we're brilliant at having babies, not always in the same places, we tend to have them in different places. So more and more, they'll be born in places that we don't really understand, that don't have our culture, etc. And one of the things is that about a third of the world's population will live in Muslim countries by 2050. That doesn't make them Muslim, but they're Islamic countries, and they may or may not follow Islam but they will have a different mindset, a reference point, than Judeo-Christian, North American, Europeans. Very, very different markets, and they're not staying still. They are migrating. So from an economic migrant perspective, from a climate change perspective, people are determined to be moving to other places. We've got you know, the boat people coming across the, 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 the channel. is only the, the tip of the sword, if you like, in terms of the amount of change and movement that people are looking for collectively, globally. So we can expect a huge amount of migration to different countries. The one thing we haven't discussed and agreed on as a people is what do we feel about it? There's no discussion about what we feel about migrants. Do we want more people? Do we want less people? Do we want open borders? Do we want controlled borders? Do we like illegal migration? Do we like lower cost economies? Do we want them to drive down our costs? Why has, why has America got a very porous border with cheap people coming over the border, which they could stop tomorrow if they wanted to? What, that we're not having the discussions about real things, but as people, we do need to have, I'm afraid. An example, let's pick on London for a moment. London is one of the cities, not all, of course, you've got places like Bradford and Leeds and some parts of Birmingham, but London, for example, about 37, 40% of people were not born in Britain. So you've got massive new cultures of people coming in with different mindsets, attitudes, aspirations, procurement, who are their reference points? Where do they get their wisdom from? Who do they listen to in terms of buying and, and investing in and buying houses and, and behaviours? So we're completely different people than we were before, and it's happened in one generation. And that's the trick we need to think about, what it is for us in our markets, with our products, with our services, who are we talking to, what do they think, where are they from, what are their values, and much more at a sociological level, even in our business. And think about this, this is fun, ageing population. I'm quite like, I'm, I'm one of these. I'm an aging population, I'm a, a market of one in the room by the look of things. Look, broadly speaking, this is the number of people over 60. So back in 1950, 8%, by 20, 2000, it was 10%, and by 2050, it's going to be about 21% of people in the world. We'll do the world for a minute, is that okay? All right, so that's fine, that's interesting. We're going to double the percentage of people in the world who are over 60. Well, when you put it into people, you're then looking at 700 million people in 2000 and 2.1 billion people in 2050. So it's treble the number of people by 2050, 
physically the number of people, not just double the percentage, it's treble the number of people. So you've got two billion people, not a bad market to shake a stick at, yeah? So you've got two billion people who are over 60, who think differently, behave differently, have got different reference points than perhaps you might consider if you go for just young markets. What's really interesting, we're all at a, at a billion people over 60. Well, that in itself doesn't really matter that much. What's more important is that by 2100, we'll have over 3 billion people over 60. In fact, probably we'll have more because our rate of dying will probably slow. At the moment, it's slightly sped up a little bit because of a whole bunch of reasons, but it will probably slow because of some of those technologies and behaviours I was talking about, or capabilities, and they will have 3 billion at least over 60. And the fastest growing cohort in Britain, by the way, is the over 85s. So not a bad cohort to shake a stick at. And by the way, they've got all the money. So if you want to go after other people, go after the, the young kids have got no money, but the, young, the older people have got all the asset, all the money, go after that lot. It's not very sexy as a market, but that's where the money is. Moving on, uh, people, love people. What's really interesting now is we're talking about six generations in the, work, in the workforce. Six generations at home. Let me ask you a question. Have you got websites with your products and services on? Yeah. Well, of course you have. It was 20, 30-year-old technology. Right. For every one of your products and services, how many pages do you give separated by demo the demography of people reading it? So you've got six-point grey text with modern icons for the 20 and 30-year-olds. You've got you know, uh, uh, older uh, um, reference points for the over 50s, who are probably the senior managers who are looking at all your products and services. You've got different text, different font, different styles, different language, different iconography. Yeah? So you've got multiple pages for different demographies of people looking at your website. Yeah? Oh, you've just got one. Right, so all the others know that you don't want them. So the over 40s and 50s whose eyes are dimming, they cut, the light's not getting in quite the same way, have to put spectacles on, they can't read your text. So you're telling them, you're not my target market. Or you're telling all the young dynamic people who are starting businesses, get, getting up, thrusting their way up the business with these old-fashioned fuddy-duddy pages for old people, that they're not their business. Or do we actually target by age? Hmm? Bit of a thought, isn't it? And that's what we do. By the way, my, all my reports are 12-point text now because I got that fed back to me quite early on. But a lot of people who are interested in what I do can't read it. Moving on, what's interesting about the demographics, the various cohorts, and I'm sure you're into this in a big way, is on a cohort level, we think differently. So over here, the baby boomers, we're very loyal, if you like. We're very able to network and collaborate, if you like. If you go over here to the, um, the younger ones, you've got stereotypes of thinking but they just get tech. So we know that, which is the, uh, the Generation Y, but Gen Z, Generation Y, they want to be left alone. They don't want to have the same close management and, and loyal structures. They're not, they want to just know what you want to achieve and they want to be left alone to do it. So you've got different thinking in each of these. So when you do things at work, do you do them differently for different age cohorts in your firm? Or we just treat everybody the same, given their rank or position or role? Yeah, okay. Well, it's a way of thinking. Do we do that? Is that good? How are they reacting? Are they reacting the same way? What are they doing in their spare time? What are they reading? What books do they read? What people do they hang out with? You know, we are different people. We think differently. So thinking about that is quite cool. This is quite a good example. Young people's voting preferences by age group, 18 to 24-year-olds, very social, caring, very justice-oriented, voting Labour. Forget the... Re I'm not one way or the other, but voting Labour. By the time you get to... 50 and 60, we're all voting conservative. Because we, we care about more of the things I've got I want to keep. So I'm more traditional in that sense, if I put it in those terms. Just one little aspect. People think differently in these two because of age. And therefore, we need to think differently about the people what, reading my things, looking at my things. I mean, young kids only want to watch videos. So you've got all your products are on videos, yeah? Of course you are. Yeah, and that's the whole point. Younger people want to consume that. Two, three-minute videos from an interesting aspect, not hard-written things. But you've got hard-written things for the older people, yeah? Yeah, that's the whole point. You can't have one because it doesn't suit everybody. I need to get on. Automation everywhere. We've talked about that. Manual, we automated manual things. Then we automated clerical things with data processing. We, we automated managerial decisioning a few years ago. And now we're automating professional. And what's dead cool is, I love this, is Jack Ma said that the, in the future, the next CEO or a CEO will be on the front of time as CEO of the year award as a machine. 
Because you can probably think quicker, faster, better, more to, uh, consistently for the human being. I'm, I was cheeky, I made it 2035. But the whole point is that we will increasingly have in our firms these sorts of technologies embedded. But what most people think is, of this technology, how does it change my job? How does it change my work? How do I need to interact with it? And that's the thing we need to focus on. Most people care, how will this change what I do? What impact will it have on me at work? And of course, the real issue is that you know, AI, generative AI or artificial general intelligence, has the capacity to replace or 300 million full-time jobs, according to Goldman Sachs, who did a study on this quite recently. So 300 million jobs is quite a lot of jobs worldwide need to change. And the issue is not um, just replacing them, it's training people to embrace these. I mean, we've got trainers, maintainers, and explainers of the three categories for new technology. So train people on what it is, maintain it so you can use it, and explain what it does for your business. We need human beings in those roles around all tech. Trainers, maintainers, explainers, which is cool. Oh, I bet you are getting tired. <laughs> You're just getting tired of hearing me. I know that. Look, here's another one. This is for you to consume later on, not necessarily now. But there's a lot of work being done on looking at generative AI in particular. What are we still good at as human beings? And what are we not good at? And actually, you'll be surprised. What we're not good at includes things like generating new ideas. We're not necessarily good at that. We're not very good at analysis of anything. Machines are much better normally at analysis if you can get it into digital form. Uh, information providing, of course, uh, and refinement of ideas. But what we're brilliant is sense making. So bringing together um, divergent strands of thinking to come up with new ideas and propositions. Machines are a long way from that. Engaging physically with human beings, machines are pretty poor at. You know, basically on that medical example again, I do not want a machine to tell me that I've got terminal cancer. I would like a machine to know that, if it must, but tell a human being to tell me. That's just what I would prefer. I don't want a machine to send me an email or, a, or an SMS or a WhatsApp saying you've got three weeks, two days to live. Oh, thank you. What do I do with that? So basically, in understanding what tech can do for you and generative AI in particular, and artificial general intelligence, which is what's coming before too long, um, is important to you. We're nearly there, then we're gonna leave you with a few things to think about and what some of this might mean for you. The two things that I think that broadly we agree on, we need people with tech skills, and by the way, everybody, including the work I did recently with the British Army, they need, and health and other firms, need the same skills as you do. So getting access to them through third parties or partners or employing them is going to be key in the future. So you need to be someone with the, with the right values that these people want to come and work with to help you adapt to all this change. And the other one, of course, is emotional skills, the physical skills of human beings talking to human beings as they go through all this change. So we need a lot of human emotional skills as well as we need technological skills. They're the two, uh, well, there's nearly everything anyway, but that's basically it. And one of those things that it's adapt, uh, um, uh, is required is um, these skills, I said, sense-making, I've already mentioned, social intelligence, understanding how the, our societies operate and therefore how do we work Adaptive thinking, I don't know how many people you've got in your firms who are a menace, who never do things in a straight line, who always add something to the spreadsheet, who don't know what consolidation really means, who's always telling you a new idea. The ones you've probably told to shut up because they're always coming up with new ideas and you just want them to get on with their job. Well, some of these people are quite valuable at this particular moment in time, so keeping them hanging around is a good thing if you give them something worthwhile to do as they make sense of all this change. Cross-cultural, because of all the things I talked about, new people emerging from different places with different background and experience, and all of the issues of not in the UK, if you're international, are going to become much more important. Therefore, you know, cross-cultural is going to be important. That diversity thing is the tip of the iceberg. We've got a lot more to go. Um, computational, of course, IT, but don't bother code. There's no point. You know, various forms of AI will deal with coding. Coding is a waste of time. So don't get your kids or your grandkids to learn that. But do learn what it can do. What can various technologies do for our firms? Equally, new media, because there are going to be a lot, like I mentioned, virtual reality, um, extended reality, augmented reality. They do different things and allow you to do different things. And we need to think about them. And of course, transdisciplinary, because technologies will work in t tend to work in disciplines. But transdisciplinary, crossing borders between various disciplines, will help us either create new sub-segments, 
which is going to happen, or allow us to understand the potential of new sub-segments sub when they emerge. So that's going to be quite important. To so that's just some of the things we might like to think about that matter for us, or they might not, of course. Very quickly, this is a bit of fun. What skills should students learn at school? I was speaking at a school, so I just sort of, actually, I asked ChatGPT. What should they be learning? All of those things, which they pretty much are. And they say, well, what technology should they learn at school? Um, good news was it's most of the things I talk about. So I didn't get that massively wrong, although I could have been replaced in a three-second engagement with ChatGPT. And it comes out with this stuff. Who uses GPT? Yeah, of course you do. And we can interrogate that. And that's the sort of new work we're going to be doing increasingly. So new jobs, things like prompt engineers. How many of you have got prompt engineers at work who really know how to use GPT-4? Really know how to interrogate it well? Yeah? Because we need people who really get it. It's not just a slightly better version of Google. It's, it's, an, it's a completely different animal. Um, systems designers, because they are going to change. You can read those as quickly as I can talk about them. But basically, there'll be new roles that we'll be doing in our world. And you know, I would probably argue, that those, and many will, foresight executives will be increasingly, and they are being in big firms, more prevalent. What do we do thinking about the future? What do we take on board? What do we think about where we're going? And by the way, your clients very often like you having a view of your future, because it gives them confidence you know what you're doing and where you're going. So it's a good thing to do from a marketing, commercial, PR perspective, as well as good anyway. Body part maker, because you can do. It's a good place to be, isn't it? Make all sorts of bits, we can live a bit longer. Nanomedic, because that's going to be important. A old age wellness manager, because if I live to 240, you know, I'll need to be managed. My knowledge and experience is still there, so I'll need to, to deal with the fact that I'm 240 years old. And if you use biblical reference, we can live to 700 years, why not? So maybe we thought that was wrong for years, but now it turns out it's right. So there is possibly a point at which, which you're not at yet, there's a point at which we'll live forever. And, you know, maybe virtual teachers. Increasingly, we've been trying to do that during the pandemic, but virtual teachers, by, like the Khan Academy, is, is doing that more and more. It's brilliant. Uh, we don't need to have a, a, a reasonably good teacher. We'll have the best one on planet Earth in front of my kids teaching me or teaching me in the workplace. I don't need just a good person. I want the best person for me now. And maybe I'll have 30 people in the room and they're all learning from a different teacher because the, each of our styles is different and our preferences are different. So we can be very adaptive. And all the rest of those things you've read already. The good news is a lot of this is about adapting. It's not whole jobs, it's tasks that are being automated. And people's, bits of people's works will be automated and the remainder will be left as physical and human activity. And that's the trick, is to build that um, um, understanding of what needs to be changed and how you change it. And finally, you know, working about what values you want to have in your world of work and teamwork and ultimately, the value of all that technology, what's the value of human beings? And a lot of insurance companies, who I work with quite a bit, are now talking about the value of human beings in the process and thinking very differently about the role of human beings, not doing the by rote things, the easy things. It's simply thinking about how we engage other human beings in our whole cycle of engagement. Oh, is that enough? <laughs> Too much, good, here's the question. So that's it, too much. Of course it's too much. It gives you an idea, some of the things about human beings and how we're changing. And really, you know, the question is, what does that mean for us? 